Good day, YouTubers. This is the first video in the series on fishing the northern end of Moreton Bay. I had planned to do this a little bit differently to the way I've done the southern and central bay. I'm not sure how that's going to work out. I'm certainly going to do it a bit slower than I did the other series, and I think I'll intersperse it with videos from another series that I wanted to do, and that is fishing offshore. So I thought I'd do some videos of fishing the northern bay or fishing offshore whenever I go out there and fill in the gaps and give you some more marks around the areas where I've been. I don't know how that's going to go because it's very weather dependent. Sometimes the weather just doesn't suit going to where I want to do a video on. So I may end up doing it the way I did the central bay. We'll just see what happens over time. Because they're probably going to be a bit erratic, if you're not already subscribed, you might want to hit that subscribe button and the notify bell beside it so you're notified when I put a video up and if it's of interest to you, you can come and have a look at it. But in the meantime, let's have a look at this one. I'll just start off by explaining what I've designated as the northern section of Moreton Bay. It's a completely arbitrary mark. I've decided that Moreton Bay is divided into southern, central and northern sections, basically on the geography. Southern Bay has lots and lots of islands packed in. Central Bay has less islands further apart. And the Northern Bay basically has none. For me, the Northern Bay extends from the northern point of Mud Island, draw a line east-west across the northern point of Mud Island, and draw another line east-west from Combiuro Point across to Bribey Island. That's what I've decided to designate as Northern Morton Bay, and that's what I'll be talking about in this series. I've got quite a few marks in this area. Some of them are mine. I'd say most of them are probably public. There's not as many marks as I have in the central bay or offshore because I haven't spent as much time fishing this area. However, I think I might have a couple of marks that aren't generally known. Stay with the videos and see if you know them all. We'll start off this by going out along the shipping channel and talking about the fishing opportunities there. I'll have to come back and revisit it because I don't have the video material, the screenshots from the sounders that I'd like to have to cover it in its entirety. So I'll do what I can in this episode and at some point later on in the series we'll come back and revisit it with some other areas that I know about on the channel, complete the screenshots so you can see what I'm talking about. But just before we get into that, I'd like to take you through some of the history of the shipping channel which is quite fascinating. If you've watched my previous videos, you'll know I'm a bit of a fan of the history of Moreton Bay. It's very fascinating and I'm not going to bore you with all of it, but just a few little points I want to touch on here and there in these series. Bear with it, it won't take long. I guess everyone that goes boating on Moreton Bay has heard about the tide times at the Brisbane Bar, but how many of you actually know where the Brisbane Bar is? I know I didn't as a young fella. The only bar I really knew about when I was a young fella were the bars between Stradbroke and Morton Island, South Passage Bar and Jumpin' Pin Bar. Anyway, there used to be a bar at the mouth of the Brisbane River and that's the Brisbane Bar. Because the Brisbane Bar was very shallow, a lot of the ships coming in had to wait for the tides in order to come into the river and the larger ones couldn't come in so they had to send smaller boats out and offload them in the bay, which is very labour intensive and time consuming. As you can imagine, the shipping barons weren't very happy about having their ships sit around unnecessarily, so they dredged a channel through the bar which was completed in 1864 to allow some of the bigger ships to come into the river. By the end of 1867, 950 vessels had used the channel to come into the river without major incident. Of course, dredging the bar was an ongoing process that never stopped, and by 1904 they'd managed to achieve a depth of 24 feet throughout. Since then it's gotten deeper and deeper because ships have gotten bigger and bigger and draw more water. Now, the politics involved in the dredging of the Brisbane Bar is quite interesting in itself. There's two channels proposed, the Francis Channel and the Heath Channel. The original one was completed in 1866 and that was the Francis Channel, but Heath never gave up on pushing for his route for the channel and work commenced on dredging that in 1882 and in 1883 the new channel was operational. The outer entrance to the Francis Channel was always marked with a light ship that was moored there, but 
that wasn't suitable for the new channel, so the Brisbane Pyrolite was built to mark the entrance to the new channel. Now it's fairly likely that's another name that you've heard around, the Brisbane Pyrolite, but if you're like me, you didn't know what it was. Well, if that's the case, you're about to find out. Work commenced on dredging a new cutting in 1908 and it was finally finished on October 1912 and that's the channel that we use today. Because of that was moved to a new position, they needed a new pylite, so the old one that you see pictured was dismantled and a new one was erected at the new location. It remained there until the 1960s where it was destroyed and at the same time the old pylite was finally completely dismantled instead of just taking the platform away and leaving the piles there. And just to complete the history of the pyrolites, an automated pyrolite replaced the manned one in 1952 and it was deactivated in 1966 when the final dismantling occurred. I'm a bit disappointed that I never did get to see the pyrolites. I'm not that old, some of them were way before my time, but I mean, even the automated one in 1966. Because in 1966 would have been about the time we were still playing with our first bait, or Dad's first bait. Oh, sorry, no, not Dad's first bait, but the first bait Dad had since I was on the scene. And, you know, we are getting around Peel Island, Coochie, all that end of the bay, neighbour to Maclay, Goat, Bird, Stradbroke, and just sort of learning our way around the bay, talking to people, learning how to fish it, all back in those days. About the time that they were dismantling the last pilot. Okay, well I've managed to talk about this for a lot longer than I intended. I find it fascinating, you may not, but for those of you that do, I will put some links in the description to some web pages where you can go and read about it if you're interested. Anyway, if you're not here to listen to this, you want to hear about the fishing along the shipping channel, so let's talk about that. We'll start off at the mouth of the Brisbane River and there's a string of beacons there marking the shipping channel. They get pretty close together down that end of the shipping channel. It's going back a fair while. I can't remember exactly when it was, but some point in the past anyway, when I discovered that beacons held bait fish, I dropped a sabiki rig down there to get some live bait and that was around. I've never fished those particular group of beacons for larger fish. It's quite likely there are larger fish around, but I just never got around to trying them. There's plenty of larger fish around the beacons further out, but we'll get to them. I haven't been around those beacons for many years, but I imagine they'd still hold some bait. It's pretty obvious, but I will say it, that if you're fishing anywhere along the shipping channel, just stay out of the way of the big ships. They can't stop or turn very quickly, and it's up to you to stay out of their way. Other than that, it is a very productive ground to fish in. And once you're outside that initial group of beacons, they start to spread out a little bit, and the next one out is marked EBA on the maps. I can't say I've ever fished that for large fish, I'm pretty sure that at some point I did fish it for bait fish, and I'm pretty sure that I did get some bait fish off of it. And it's going back a few years. A little bit further out from that, there's the measured mile beacons. That's a pair of beacons that are supposedly, and I don't doubt it really, but they're supposed to be an exact measured mile apart, and that's a nautical mile if you measure it on the chart, not a statute mile. Nevertheless, the distance apart is irrelevant because they often hold a lot of bait fish and where there's bait fish, there's big fish. And I have caught big fish on these beacons. I've also caught bait fish on these beacons. Not there all the time. If you go there and you do a circle around the beacons and you don't see any bait fish on your sounder, you can forget about the big fish. That's been my experience anyway. But if you're going past them, they're always worth having a look around. I wouldn't say one is better than the other. It just sort of depends. Sometimes the fish will be on one, sometimes they'll be on the other, sometimes they'll be on both or none. And out close to Morton where the shipping channel turns north to go and follow alongside Morton for a while, you'll find the four beacons. Like the measured mile, I guess everyone's heard of the four beacons and they are what you'd expect, four beacons relatively close together marking the turning. I can say the same for them as I've said about the measured mile. I've caught big fish there, I've caught bait fish there. Probably caught more bait fish than big fish, but that's because there's more bait fish. Because the big fish usually eat them before they get to grow into big fish. But kidding aside, 
it's a good spot to fish. It's usually got a few boats around it. Sometimes got more than a few boats around it these days. But if you're going past and there's room to get in, have a look at it. You want to fish up fairly close to the beacons, or at least that's my strategy. Get up within, or oh, I don't know, 20 feet of the beacons. I use them in Coda these days. If I was, I was never that good at anchoring and getting myself pinpointed on the beacon, but I can do it with the Minkota. Just moving back to the west again a little bit, there's a couple of spots where ships will anchor while they're waiting to go into the port. They're marked on the maps with a big circle, and they're usually shown as anchor berths on the maps. Now sometimes when there's been a ship there for a little while and he's got his anchor out, it used to be a good thing to go and drop a speaky rig down alongside the anchor chain because there'd often be a lot of fish hanging around there. I guess it could have been big fish as well, something I never tried, I didn't stay there long. The crews of the ships either ignored me or just gave a shout, but that's going back a few years now before terrorism was a thing, so I'm not sure how you get on with it these days. Maybe they'll get a little bit excited if a small boat gets too close to their ship. As before you do because as you can see in this slide, there's a notice to mariners out to stay away from this area because they're offloading LPG gas. That's an explosive, and you don't want to be there if they have an accident. And I guess, following up on what I said in that last section, they don't want terrorists hanging around to cause an accident either. So I expect if you try to go in there when they've got one of these notices to mariners out, that you're going to cause a bit of a kerfuffle and probably have the police launch out chasing you. I'll put a link down in the description where you can go to look at the notices to mariners. They're always good to check up on. You never know what's happening in the bay and they will inform you of anything that you need to know about. They're the maritime equivalent of NOTAMs, which are notices to airmen, and the air navigation orders make it quite clear that you need to check your NOTAMs before you go out flying. And the same can be said about being on the water. You should check your notice to mariners before you go out, just in case there's something there to affect you. Going out along the shipping channel between the Port of Brisbane and Moreton Island, again, there's a lot of little patches of rocky reef, I would imagine. So I'm guessing coffee rock, although I don't know. I've never dived on it, so I don't know exactly what's down there. But there is some sort of reef. As I said, I'm guessing that it's a rocky reef. And you will pick up some fish there, but they're only small patches. Without a GPS mark, you won't find them. And most of my GPS marks are in this old unit here, which has been sitting in the shed waiting to be thrown out because it's totally useless and I'll never be able to get the marks back out of it. Again, back in the days before we had SD cards and that, where it was easy to move your marks around. I guess I should have written them down on paper, but I didn't. I have found a couple of them since losing that lot. But as I said, without a GPS mark, they're very hard to find. So as I've been going out there, I have been having a bit of a look around to see if I can locate any of them. I've got a couple to put in this video. And as I find more, I'll come back in subsequent videos and add them as provided I can find them. Because as I said, they're only small patches and they're easy to miss. Don't worry about the green crosses for the moment. They're just spots that I want to check out in the future. I haven't checked them out, so I'm not sure they're there. I've just picked them from looking at the Navionics map and the bottom structure, and I've decided that they're possibilities. They're roughly in areas where I think there should have been something. So I'll go and check them out one day. But for the moment, I'm just going to show you these two red crosses in detail, three red crosses in detail. The three crosses are within a 100 metre diameter circle. So they're quite close together. The screenshots from the sounder are split screen with the zoomed in section showing the bottom three meters. As you can see, moving just within a circle of 100 meters makes a huge difference to what you find on the bottom and what the structure looks like. So make sure when you go to any of my marks that you have a good sound around because the fish won't be directly on the mark. They'll be near it if they're there at all but they're not going to be directly on it, so you need to sound around and find just where they are. In general, I haven't seen these marks shared at all. You won't find them on any of the public forums. What you can do is if you see a boat fishing along the shipping channel and he's nowhere near anything in particular, without going too close, take a mark and a bearing to where he is, and sometime when he's not there, come back and have a fossick around and see if you can see anything that he might have been fishing on, any sort of structure on the bottom. 
It's cheating a little bit, but it's a lot quicker than just running up and down the shipping channel trying to find the marks for yourself. Just remember, don't crowd him too close. Stay well away from him, take your mark and a bearing to him and you'll get there from there if it's there at all. Just a general note too, uh, north of the measured mile and over around Shark Spit in particular, you'll see the maps marked with unexploded ordnance. That dates back to World War II, there's a lot of ordnance in the bay. I remember back in the late 60s, maybe the early 70s, trawlers were pulling up boxes of Owen guns that had been dumped there after the war and they were selling them on the black market until it became common knowledge and the Navy moved in and retrieved their Owen guns and went and put them somewhere else. Legend has it that they took them outside and dumped them in the deeper ocean, but they're not saying where they dumped them. But that's a true story. It was in the newspapers at the time. You could probably search the Courier Mail and find a reference to it. And on reflection, I think it was probably more likely to have been the early 70s rather than the late 60s. Long time to remember back. It's hard to know where to go to next to maintain continuity. My first feeling was that I'd go up the shipping channel, but then that leads us to the Pearl Channel and back down into the Central Bay. So I think what I'll do is we'll jump over to Morton and go up along the west coast of Morton, talking about what's there, and we'll cover the fishing ground coming back towards the mainland in subsequent episodes. We covered the Blue Hole in the central Morton Bay series, which is on the border of the centre and northern Morton Bay, as I've defined it. But just north of the Blue Hole, there's the Little and Big Sand Hills, and in between them, there's a beautiful anchorage. Got a reasonable beach, you get a lot of whiting fishing there, and there's a bit of reef not far from there. So if you're looking for an anchorage to hole up in, in that area, have a look at that. It's pretty good from winds anywhere from the north around through the east to the south. Naturally, it's better on easterly winds because you've got Morton Island to protect you from them. But if you get in close to the shore, you're reasonably well protected from the north and the south as well, depending on wind strength, of course. Just looking at the reef out from the sand hills, it's classified as massive coral on the research maps. It's a sort of a kidney shaped reef. The centre of it is at the point that I've marked, roughly. Bearing in mind that the shape of the reef is from surveys, the centre is a rough uh, estimate of where the centre of it is. But if you go to the centre and start sounding around, you should be able to see the reef and find somewhere to fish without any trouble. I haven't fished this area since I had the big boat and I used to fish out of the tender when we were staying at the sand hills. As you can see, the three beacons in the area form a triangle and if you draw a line from the beacon furthest into the shore, east-west, and stay south of that line but not too far away from it, you'll be over the area of the reef. That's sort of how we did it back in the day. You line up some landmarks and that's how you got onto the area. That's before we had a GPS to put us precisely on the spot. You shouldn't have any trouble with a GPS and a sounder these days anyway. You should find it no trouble. Used to fish okay. Can't remember exactly what I used to catch there. Didn't fish it as much as I did other areas. But used to pull some squire and sweet lip, I think, out of that area. As I said, if you go north of that along the sand banks, you'll pick up whiting. So plenty of fish in that area if you're staying there. And as I discovered a few episodes back, there's also sand crabs along that sandbank. So if you're staying overnight, it might pay to drop a pot in. I wish I'd known that back in the day. I'd always been told there are no crabs at Morton. I just had a quick look to see how much video I had for this episode, and I'm already up to nearly 20 minutes, so I'm going to bring this episode to an abrupt halt at this point. I will, of course, continue on in a later episode. I know I've talked a little bit about the history of Morton Bay in this episode and only given you a few points and some general information on fishing the area. We'll get into some more detail in later episodes. Sorry about the history, I just can't help myself, I'm fascinated by it. I hope at least some of you enjoy the history of it. If you like this series, don't forget to check out the series on the central Morton Bay and southern Morton Bay. All of those episodes are in the All About Morton Bay playlist. If you'd like to see some more of my videos, you can go to my YouTube channel. If you don't want to miss any of these series on the Northern Morton Bay, or if you want to pick up on the 
fishing offshore series that I'm going to do. I don't know whether I'll start that in parallel with this series or run it as a separate series afterwards. But if you don't want to miss any of those, hit that subscribe button and the bell notification beside it. I thank you for watching this video. I hope you got something out of it. I hope you do well with the fishing spots I've suggested. Until next time, good fishing.